God is good. All right. Second <coughs> Peter chapter 2 uh, in the Word of God tonight. Amen. Go down, please. And we're going to look at verse 4, all right? Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Amen. If you have it, say praise the Lord. All right. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an inseparable unto those that after should live ungodly. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy words. Give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Title of the message tonight, If God Spared Not the Angels. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Think about that. God judging angels that sinned. Divine, divine spirit beings. Psalm 82 calls them gods, little g. Elohim, little g, little gods. Because they are divine spirit beings that live in the heavenly realm. Everything that lives on the earth, lives in the earthly realm, has to do with like mankind. Okay? But the angels are divine spirit beings. Now, I want you to think about that. Divine spirit beings. Okay? That God created. The Bible says in Psalm 82 that he actually stands in the congregation of the mighty. Stands in the congregation of the El or the gods. And he judges the gods. And then he goes on and he says, you shall die like men. These spirit beings. So you're going to die like men. So we have in this passage something that is startling to me. That if God spared not the angels, those divine spirit beings. He says that here in this verse, cast them down to hell or Tartarus. Tartarus is the Greek word. Now, who are these angels that he's talking about that sinned and then he cast them down to Tartarus? Well, Genesis chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 4, uh, talks about the fallen ones. Okay, these angels, they came down to the daughters of men. You know, they looked upon the daughters of men, these angels that were in heaven, looked upon the daughters of men, came down upon them had relationships with them, and produced the Nephilim, or the giants. Now, we have preached to you about the giants out of the book of Deuteronomy. We preached to you about the Nephilim out of the book of Genesis, out of the book of Jude, etc. And so this is the ones he's talking about. These divine spirit beings took upon the form of a man, came down from heaven, left their first estate, cohabitated with the daughters of men, produced offspring by them called the Nephilim, the giants, okay? So those giants were part demonic and part human. A monstrous outcome of that decision. And so the Bible says because of that, Genesis 6, 1, then we have in 2 Peter chapter 2, we have uh, the book of Jude, verses 14 and 15, it talks about what happened to them. God put them in Tartarus. In the Greek minds, the Greek mind of the day, this word here that we see in the English hell is Tartarus. They understood, the Greeks understood that's where the Titans were cast down. Okay? The fallen ones, the Titans, where they were cast down. So the word Titan is related to the fallen angels, okay? Now, in teaching you the book of Judith, you will remember uh, that she made a statement here in Judith 16. 
She said, But the Lord Almighty has foiled them by the hand of a woman, for their mighty one did not fall by the hands of a, uh, the young men. Remember she killed that king? Nor did the sons of the Titans strike them down. Nor did tall giants set upon him, but Judith, daughter of Moriah, with the beauty of her countenance, undid him. So we, even in the Apocrypha, many times there is a reference to these Titans. That's the Greek understanding of who they were. So the Titans were said to have been cast down and put in that prison called Tartarus, locked in that prison because they had fallen. Think about that. They were in heaven. And so at one point, that means that they were saved, if you can understand what I'm trying to get to today. They were with God. They were in heaven. But because of their sin, God cast them out, put them in chains of darkness. Because they rejected light, now they are chained in darkness. When we study this, and we see that God would even do that with angels. Peter is using this to warn the church. Amen throughout history, that once saved and, you know, living for the Lord, you will be saved. But once saved, departing from God, you'll be lost. And so this, this chapter really is, to me, it puts a temperature, a thermometer in the mouth of the church. It puts a thermometer in my mouth. It's very serious. It's a very serious message. And we do need to heed it, okay? Because we're going to see characteristics of fallen ones. And God is using the characteristics of fallen ones. He's going to show you what is the characteristic, what is the temperature of somebody who used to know God, but they are no longer living for God. What are they like? What is their character like? What is their future going to be? So it is a very, very serious message. In fact, it is so serious that this is Peter's deathbed message to the church. It is his deathbed message, revelation to his family, the church, okay? one fourteen, Peter says this, Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as, I, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me, so he's fixing to die right before he dies. And, of course, tradition says they took him and they crucified him upside down on a cross in Rome. Now, I'm not actually sure if that actually happened, but that's the tradition. So when he gives this message, it's really a deathbed speech. It is a deathbed message, and we need to listen to it. And this is the area God gave me to preach to you tonight. If God spared not the angels. First of all, in chapter 1, as Peter talks about as he's about to die, he talks about the origin of Scripture. How do we get the Word of God? How do we get the Scripture? And the reason why he does that in the overall context of Peter is, He's trying to show you that if you and I will follow the Scripture, if we'll live by the Scripture, it will protect us from falling. So what he does, he's going to give us a contrast between true prophets, true apostles versus false prophets and false teachers, okay? The true apostles, he says this, verse 19, chapter 1. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein to you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He's talking about there the second coming of the Lord. When he talks about the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, you have an understanding inside of you of the coming of the Lord. It's the second coming of Jesus. Verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't study the Bible and interpret it. What that means is what he's saying is it doesn't have a man-made origin. So he's giving you the origin of Scripture. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, 
But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So until Jesus comes back, as the Bible says here, the day dawn and the day star rise in our hearts. Until he comes back, what Peter is saying is that we need to follow the scriptures until he comes back to avoid deception. Talks about true prophets where they got their message. There are true prophets. There are true prophets. Thank God that there are true prophets. Thank God that there are true preachers. Amen. Thank God there are true teachers. But he's contrasting the true prophets that get their message from God with false prophets and false teachers. Okay. So we are to listen to the true prophets of God, the Word of God, because we got the Word from God. But he talks about these false ones in chapter 2 that he compares the angels that sinned with. And uh, they are basically a picture of or to all of us, okay? Verse 1. I'm going to tell you, this is heavy. But there were false prophets also among the people. Now, he's talking about way back in the Old Testament days, correct? There were false prophets among the people. He's going all the way back to the Old Testament and he says, remember. He's trying to put the church in memory. He says, remember there were false prophets also among the people. And as you study the Old Testament, you're going to see those false prophets. You had true prophets of God that spoke as they were under the unction of the Holy Ghost, directed by the Spirit of God. They had the Word of God coming to them, and they were declaring the Word of God to the people. But there were also false prophets, if you will, that that came in among the church of the Old Testament. Then Peter prophesies. He says, just like there were false prophets in the past among the people, he says, prophetically, there shall be false teachers among you. Okay? That's heavy. He is prophesying. He is telling them. He's telling the church. He's prophesying. He's telling the church, prophesying to them that there's going to come into that church people who are going to teach things that are not correct. He's warning the church in advance that that is going to happen. Okay? Everybody with me? He calls them false teachers. And they will come among you. Now who? So these false teachers are going to come among them, among the church. And... Uh, prophetically, he's telling them that. He's telling us that. Amen? So if they're false teachers, that means they're pretenders. Who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. So these people that are going to bring these teachings, these heresy is a, is a false teaching. Heresy means to twist the word. Whoa, heavy. See, they're still going to take the word. They're still going to speak the word. But what they're doing is they're going to twist that word. Are you understanding what I'm saying? They're going to twist the word of God. See, they're not going to throw it away. They're not going to do away with it. They're going to take it and they're going to twist it. And they're going to use it and present the word of God in a manner that is not correct. Oh, you've got to hear this, okay? Please hear this. There are people who stand in pulpits. There are people that don't stand in pulpits. There are church people. There are church memberships. People that are in the church. They carry Bibles under their arms. But what they're saying about the Word of God is not correct. It's twisted. And why is it twisted? It's twisted so that they can live the way they want to live. All right? That's their motive. To twist the Word of God. Basically, we can live however we want to. We can do whatever we want to. 
and still be saved. Okay? So it's damnable heresies. It will cause people to be lost. If we listen to what they're saying, if we listen to what they're teaching, it will cause us to be lost. Everybody with me? Okay. So twisting the word of God, making it say something that it's not. And he says it's damnable heresies. First of all, even denying the Lord that bought them. So the first thing is they're going to deny him. They're going to deny the Lord. They're going to reject the Lord, right? Everybody with me? They're going to deny him. In, in what way? They're going to say that he's not God. But there's more to it than that. When it says they will deny the Lord that bought them, it's more than them saying we don't believe Jesus is God. What they are doing is they are denying lordship salvation. Man, I got the Holy Ghost on me. That Jesus basically is the Savior, but you don't have to obey Him. See, they will say, we don't believe in Lordship salvation. That's what Peter is warning against. He said, there are people who are bringing in damnable heresies. They're twisting the Word of God. You know, they, they will claim that Jesus is their Savior. But they deny the need to submit to him being their Lord. Hello, church. Okay, this is heavy. Whew. Denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves a swift destruction. Swift destruction. Ruin, to be ruined and to be destroyed. Perishing is what's going to happen to them. Amen? Amen? Now we understand, don't we, the Lord is our Savior? Amen. But you, if you, you know, if you believe that you can be saved and not live for God and obey God's commands... That's what Peter's warning the church about, that kind of mindset. Right? Now, if you think about that, the flesh would appeal to that. That, that would appeal to the flesh. Because basically, you know, if you could sin and do whatever you want to, okay, Live however you want to. The flesh would enjoy that. You and I can still go to heaven that way. The flesh would enjoy that. And so Peter goes on and he says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Many. That means they're going to be the pop popular ones. Many people are going to follow them because it's a popular message. Don't worry about Jesus being Lord. Live however you want to. Do whatever you want to do. But God save me is a popular message for the flesh. And many, many will follow. I want you to say it with me. Many will follow because it appeals to that sin nature. Okay, it's going to be the popular message. Jesus is the Savior. Don't worry about how you live. Okay. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. There's going to be large numbers that, that, that believe that false teaching. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. Pernicious ways means their sensual ways. The word sensual here is connected especially to sexual sin. That is why it talks about the fallen angels. If God spared not the angels. The connection is they came down and committed sexual sin. 
So it says, whoever these people are, okay, whoever these teachers are, they're leading multitudes astray. They're meeting, leading a lot of people away from God's Word. They're leading a lot of people away from God by basically saying, you know, in their pernicious ways, their sensual ways, it's okay. To commit sexual sin. It's sort of like the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in the book of Revelation. The Bible says, which Jesus says, that thing I hate. Now, what was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans was basically this. You could do whatever you wanted to do with your body. You could commit, commit any sin you wanted to with your body it would not affect your spirit or your mind. And Jesus said that, it, that he hated that doctrine. These teachers are promoting a very similar thing. Sensuality. Multitudes are going to follow that. Because basically the sexuals, it's okay. It's all right. Nothing wrong with it. God still loves you. You'll still be saved. And be sensual. Everybody with me? Many shall follow their pernicious ways. It's going to be the popular thing to do. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Say the way of truth. So it talks about their per pernicious ways. There are sensual ways in contrast to the way of truth. Now I'm taking my time here because this is too important. What Peter is saying, there is an, an accepted conduct, an expected conduct for the believer. There is a right way for the believer to live. It's called the way of truth. So anybody comes along and tells you, it doesn't matter how you live. I'm a Christian just like you are. No, Paul, Peter is saying that there's two ways. There's this, the ways of the flesh. They're sensual. They don't believe in lordship salvation. And then there's the way of truth. What God expects of you and I as believers, the way to live. There is an expected way for believers, you and I, to live. The fallen ones say, it doesn't matter how you live. You're still going to be saved. Peter says, there is a way. It's called the way of truth. And so we have to. Submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life. We have to determine by His God-inspired Word what is acceptable for a Christian, the way to live as a believer. There is an expected way that God, when He looks at you and when He looks at me, he expects you and me to live a certain way. It's called the way of truth. And if we don't live the, according to the way of truth, according to the Bible, we are following in a different way. It's fleshly. It's sensual. It condones sin. And says there will be no judgment from God on it. Do you understand what the Bible is saying? We are living in an age where everybody is going to heaven. And I say that obviously sarcastically. Everybody is going to heaven. I mean, they may have never even went to church, never even professed, they even knew the Lord. But they're in heaven when they die. 
or they used to be in the, in the church of Jesus Christ, backslid out of the church, but they're still going to heaven. They're not living the way the Bible tells them to live, but they're still going to heaven. Not according to God's word. You can't be living ungodly, sensual, sinful. A way of, a pernicious way and say, and, and, and you might say it, but that's the problem. That's what they were saying. So that I'm going to say it again. There is a way of truth. It is according to the word of God. God tells us what he expects of you. What he expects of me. It is very clear. Anybody that comes with this kind of a message. That says you do not have to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And you can still be saved. Amen. You can live however you want to, sensual, give yourself to the flesh, and you'll be just fine. Turn your back on God, turn your back on the truth, reject light, and still go to heaven. Live like hell on the, listen to me, traveling the road of hell. But claiming, while you're on the road to hell, claiming to be saved. How are you going to be saved if you're traveling on the road of hell? You can't get to heaven. I can't get to heaven if I'm on the road of hell. 